thank you everyone for being here at this workshop, listening to uh, us talk. Uh, my name is Douglas Bacham. I'm the CEO of Shift Crypto. We make a Bitbox hardware wallet. Um, has anyone heard of a Bitbox before? Oh, great. Nice. Um, and yeah, I used to have a technical background, so I actually invented the original Bitbox, the 01. Um, we're now on the O2, and I, my technical background is just slowly disappearing as I'm now um, doing CEO and business stuff. Uh, and so this talk today, let's see which buttons work here. Yeah, my technical ability. So uh, the outline today, I'm going to start. Um, we have 45 minutes. Uh, I'd like to end early, hopefully, to give some time for a Q&A after. And in this talk, I'll start um, with just uh, some basics about why I use hardware wallets in general. Um, and then go into the hardware wallet threat model. Another word for threat model is the different types of attacks that the hardware wallet's trying to protect against. And then end with um, a talk on the security architecture. And we're going to try to do a live demo at the same time. Um, there's a, a computer back there with a camera. And so we'll see if that works uh, at, the, at the end. OK. So let's, let's jump in. So a uh, number of years ago, I was invited to give a talk. Um, and the keynote speaker was uh, the former director of the CIA. And he said, what did he say? There's two types of people in the world, those that have been hacked and those that have not yet been hacked. He was later corrected by every other speaker at the conference that there's two types of people in the world, that's those that know they've been hacked and those that don't know. And so the, the take home message of this conference was that if you have something valuable on your computer or your mobile phone, uh, it could be easily stolen by a thief uh, who's motivated enough. And that's for computers and phones. Of course, um, maybe you're all aware centralized exchanges are also um, not necessarily uh, the safest place uh, in the sense that billions and billions have been lost to hacks and exit scams. But imagine even if a centralized exchange has um, perfect security, um, you still have to log into this exchange and where are your login details. Maybe they're also on your computer and your phone. Um, and so this is an example of something that might be on your computer or phone that needs to be kept safe, that has a lot of value. This is another form. Uh, it's a Bitcoin seed or a, a wallet seed. And so this derives all of your, your private keys uh, and holds all of your cryptocurrencies. So keys like this hold a trillion dollars in value. A trillion dollars in value might, be, might make a thief motivated to try to do something. Now imagine if your keys are inside of this red balloon. And this is the issue with security. And so in order to protect your keys uh, from a security point of view, you need to protect the whole surface of this uh, red balloon. But an attacker only needs to find one little pinhole uh, and pop it and access the secrets. And computers and mobile phones are actually, uh, you can, it's an analogy for computers or mobile phones. They're actually designed to make this balloon bigger in the sense that they have uh, tens of millions of lines of code. They allow third parties to uh, create software that can run on these operating systems. There's app stores. There's web access and so on. And so it makes this balloon actually bigger. And so the common sense approach to protecting these keys is to make this balloon smaller and maybe use a different material other than, than rubber. And that's the whole uh, point of hardware wallets. That's where hardware wallets come in. Uh, the concept is very simple. So the keys are generated on the device. They never have to leave the device. They don't touch your computer or mobile phone where they could be seen by hackers or malware hiding there. Um, they're single-purpose computers. Uh, looks like oftentimes USB sticks. This is uh, the inside of the Bitbox itself. Ideally, they're open source. Not all of them are open source, but we think that's an important uh, aspect of security, which I'll get into later. No operating systems, and of course, keep your secrets offline. There's two general purposes. Again, uh, generate and store the keys offline. So random number generators uh, are on the device. Uh, these are very important. I'll get into that a bit later. Um, physical protection. Uh, not all hardware wallets offer this, but I believe that hardware wallets should also offer physical protection in the case that someone steals the hardware wallet itself. And I'll get into how the Bitbox does this. 
Uh, and backup and recovery also should happen offline, not touching the computer. Uh, the second purpose is usable, uh, easiness. And so there's a, a common thought that there's a trade-off between security and ease of use. Uh, however, I feel that's a false dichotomy. And the job of a hardware wallet manufacturer is to try to make something both easy and secure. And I think that's possible. Um, and of course, uh, receiving, sending coins easily, um, as was mentioned in the, the previous talk, uh, trust what's on the uh, screen itself. Don't trust what's on, on the hardware wallet screen itself. Don't trust what's on your computer or mobile phone. And so hardware wallets uh, come with the idea that um, they just assume that your hardware wallet, or sorry, they assume that your computer or your mobile phone is uh, malicious uh, and to try to protect against that. And so you have an onboard screen to verify what transactions you want to do and confirmation buttons, physical confirmation buttons to approve it. Okay, so jumping into the threat model, um, most, the, most of the rest of this talk is actually uh, having material on our website also, uh, maybe more eloquently written uh, than what I'm going to say. Um, the book, yeah, reading the book's always better than watching the movie, I guess. Um, but I'm going to try to talk about it. And so we have a, a website here for threat models. Uh, like I said before, um, it's maybe better, more easily understood as attack vectors. And so I think of maybe not just one little red pin, but lots of red pins all around. And we're trying to think of all the different ways that something can be attacked. And I'll start with that, and I'll go into how we protect against that. Uh, but first, what's out of scope? What are red pins for hardware wallets? Um, one is if you lose your backup. So if you have 12 to 24 words on a piece of paper, uh, if someone grabs that, um, they have access to your coins. Um, not much we can do about that. Another is if they steal the device itself, steal the bitbox, uh, they also steal the password to log into the bitbox. Uh, of course, your, your coins are um, at risk. You can't protect against that. And another, uh, which is very common, more and more common, is social engineering. Um, and and the main point here is if you have a seed, you have this mnemonic word list, these 12 to 24 words, don't give it to anyone. Um, that if you do that, you'll, you'll be okay. But there's a lot of social engineering tricks. Uh, for example, um, we have a Telegram support channel. Telegram is a cesspool of um, social engineering uh, experts. And lots of times, or I shouldn't say lots of times, sometimes um, there'll be tricks where they impersonate uh, company members, and then they can trick people who are asking support questions into giving up their seed. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out how to, to minimize that, but social engineering is an issue. But if you remember, just don't give your seed to anyone, not us, not anyone who's asking for support. If someone asks, it's a scam. Okay, so let's replace the red balloon with a hardware wallet. And some of the attack vectors, um, uh, it's not a comprehensive list, but what, what uh, um, we try to protect against is both software and physical uh, attacks. Uh, so software, again, your computer or an app running on the computer is malicious. Uh, firmware security bugs uh, in the code itself, of course, we need to protect against that. Uh, and physical attacks, um, those, those five items could be a whole workshop in itself, uh, but just briefly to give an idea. So invasive attacks, so someone has your uh, hardware wallet, and they try to break it open, try to use acid or lasers to scrape off, um, access the inside of chips, and try to read secrets. Um, side channel uh, is an interesting one where if you have a computer running code, it's not only spitting out zeros and ones, it's also spitting out physical phenomenon. So for example, electromagnetic radiation, uh, it's using power. Um, so you get um, up and down traces in, in power being supplied to the device. Uh, it, it's also emitting sound. So there's little vibrations happening when code is running. And this could be picked up by microphones. Um, and uh, the, you can Google it. There's lots of examples about this. It's really interesting. But thankfully, this can also be um, uh, solved through software by um, code, for example, running um, minimizing um, variability in electromagnetic radiation or power or sound by basically running what's called constant time code. Uh, and so when you do signing, for example, uh, signing a transaction with uh, cryptography, 
there's a series of additions and multiplications, and they have different amounts of computational uh, power required for them. And so, if you don't have the, if you're not using software that protects against this, um, someone could use um, an antenna, basically, even in a different room behind a wall, to uh, basically reconstruct your your secrets, your private keys. Um, yeah, brute force access. So someone steals a device, they try to brute force your password. Uh, evil made and supply chain are kind of related in the sense of someone trying to replace your device with, with an, uh, a fake device to try to get trick you into um, giving up some kind of secret. Okay. Um, also, I think it's important to mention the manufacturer is also an attack vector. Um, and there, there needs to be some trust uh, no matter what. It, if you're buying a hardware wallet, you need to have some trust in the hardware wallet manufacturer. We try to minimize that need to trust. Uh, we do that in a, a variety of ways. And also, I think it's very important to be accountable and transparent. Uh, how we do this, so open source code, I think is really important so that we can be accountable to others. Just try to bear, you know, uh, strip ourselves naked so everyone can see what we're doing and um, try not to hide anything. And so open source code, reproduce a full firmware build, that means, um, Anyone can download our code and build it themselves. And the build itself should produce identical code at the end. And we sign this firmware with our own uh, separate keys to say this is true firmware. And we only allow signed firmware into the device. But you can build the code yourself. The signatures are public. And then you can load up the firmware you built yourself into the device to know with 100% confidence that what we say we're doing with the open source code is actually what we are doing. Um, we have a bug bounty program. If there's any white hat hackers here, we're happy uh, to talk to you to try to figure out if there's more bugs, bugs we haven't found. Um, we have an option to connect to your own node. Um, there's a, I guess the talk after is about nodes, and there's a talk a little while ago about nodes. Um, just to, to mention that, so hardware wallets provide security, but they don't necessarily provide privacy. So in order to um, spend coins, you have to connect to the blockchain. And in order to do that, you have to have a, a node. And so if you're not running your own node, you have to use a node provided by the hardware wallet manufacturer. So we provide our own. Uh, others provide their own. And I'm not aware of any manufacturer doing it, but it's possible for them basically to spy on your transactions. And if they know your XPUB, they know your whole financial history. And again, I'm not aware of anyone doing it, but there's also the, the, the state uh, attack where they could force a company to do it and, and not tell anyone. So we think it's really important to uh, connect to your own node. We've offered that for, I don't know, three or four years already. I think we're the first to offer that. Um, entropy, so randomness, is also extremely important. So when you create a wallet, when you create a seed, if someone, if you're not using a good source of randomness, someone could guess what your seed is. And that's happened uh, multiple times, uh, more so with uh, online wallets using JavaScript libraries, where the JavaScript library had a, a bad source of entropy, and then people could guess um, a lot of people's seeds and a lot of money was lost that way. And so we provide high quality entropy, but we also don't want you to have to trust us. So we also, during the process of wallet creation, we also take entropy from you, as I'll explain later. And um, anti-klepto uh, signature protocol. And so this is something that's uh, a little less well known. This is also something we pioneered. It's um, uh, now merged into the Bitcoin Core database, where um, the signature itself, when you do a signature, you have to use another random number. Um, oftentimes it's uh, deterministic, deterministic K. You might have heard that. Uh, but this random number can be uh, manipulated in some ways. Uh, so it, it's similar to hashing. You try different random numbers, different random numbers, until you get a certain signature that has some bits of data um, that the, the attacker knows. And so doing this, you can basically um, exfiltrate, so uh, secret data. And so you can create signatures that send out secret bits of data. And so you have to set, you can send out the secret bits of data this goes to the blockchain, so anyone can see it. They don't, they don't need another um, special uh, system to see it. It's on the blockchain. Uh, and so there's some secret bits there, and they have to append it with some kind of marker so that they can find it. And so doing this, um, 
you can do, I don't know, 12 uh, signatures or so, and then you can actually um, extract uh, secrets from the device. And so there's a way around this called anti-klepto signature protocol, and it's using a bunch of cryptographic magic. Um, we have a blog post, you can read more about it. But basically this again uh, takes randomness from the user, in, the, in this case from the app, it could be our app or also uh, third party apps we support uh, can provide it too. And through cryptographic magic, you can prove that this random number that you supplied is also used uh, during the signature creation. Um, okay, so jumping into Bitbox security architecture. Okay, I've been talking 15 minutes, good. Um, this one's a little bit longer, but it should, should give time for um, uh, questions. Uh, and so we also pioneered what's called the dual chip security architecture. It's now been copied by a few other uh, hardware wallet companies. Um, we each do it a bit differently, and so I'll explain how we do it. Uh, but first, the, the general concept is um, using two different chips. And so MCU stands for microcontroller, um, and secure chip, like a secure element, uh, which actually has physical um, security embedded in it to prevent some of these invasive attacks. And what we do is we use uh, both chips. Um, and on the MCU, the general purpose microcontroller, um, it, it's basically a miniature computer. You can program it as you wish. And we use this to run all of the, um, uh, the protocol level code. So to do Bitcoin, uh, we have a Bitcoin only wallet. Uh, I don't know if I should say it here, but we have a, a multi edition also that does some coins other than Bitcoin. Uh, but we run all of that on um, uh, the microcontroller, uh, and so you get the benefit of um, one, being accountable, um, and two, like uh, white hat hackers can go take a look at it, and um, three is that the microcontrollers typically have more memory than the secure elements, and we can run what we consider the most well-vetted uh, cryptographic libraries. So the libraries that we're uh, very confident have side channel protection, Libraries that we're very confident have been very well vetted. So example, the Bitcoin Core LibSecP library. Um, the secure chip uh, that we use, there's different types. The one we use is uh, uh, for hardening. So providing um, um, uh, protection against invasive attacks, protection against physical theft. Um, and I'll, I'll go into uh, some of the details, but it has KDF slots for key derivation. So this is basically stretching passwords. Uh, a monotonic counter, so uh, just a number that goes up in time, um, can't go down. Um, and a slot for attestation key and random number gender. I'll get into what that means. Uh, but first of all, I'd say there's three pieces of information to unlock the seed. And so I think this is, um, uh, a quite nice security feature where um, the encrypted seed is stored on the microcontroller itself, but in order de to decrypt it, you need three pieces of information. One is from the secure chip itself, uh, this K here. One is from the microcontroller itself, a secret stored on there. And one is not on the device at all, but in your head, which is the um, device password. And so the user enters a device password. Um, there's a random number called assault. Um, the random secret uh, generated and secured on the secure chip that can't be exported. We use all these three things, cryptographically combine them, and then we're able to decrypt the seed and open the wallet. And so that means even if someone steals your device, there's not enough information on it for them to actually uh, get your secrets. They also have to figure out something that's in your head. And then we have brute force prevention mechanisms, which I'll explain that uh, uh, allows you to use a simple password. Uh, and so just to explain um, how this is all used, uh, this is a bit more technical slide. So you enter the device password on the, uh, on the Bitbox. Um, the MCU hashes this password with its unique salt. This is passed, you can see the numbers on the slide and the arrows. This is passed down to the secure chip to step three. Uh, it's stretched using multiple rounds of KDF, just KDF key derivation function. Um, this causes a delay. It takes a specific amount of time. So that means if someone tries to brute force, uh, it stretches the time. Um, 
and the counter is increased by one. I'll get back to those later. That comes back to the MCU, uh, and the result is combined again with the user password, and um, all through uh, cryptography, and then you can have the decryption key. And so an important thing is that this also allows us to not trust the secure chip. And so we try to minimize what we need, uh, minimize trust in everything, if we can. Uh, and how that is, is that uh, when we send, we don't want the secure chip to know the, the user password. Um, we want it to be independent of the user password. So even if the manufacturer put a backdoor in the secure chip, it's not going to allow you to steal your coin, or not going to allow them to have enough information to steal your coins. Um, and that's done by uh, the password being hashed. Uh, the last talk said this is a one-way function, um, as explained there. Uh, and so it doesn't know the actual password, only a hash of it. And when that comes back, um, step 3K should not be the uh, decryption key, because otherwise um, the secure chip knows what the decryption key is. So we again uh, hash the key with uh, data stored um, on the bitbox and the device password. And uh, furthermore, the secure chip has a random number generator, but we don't use only that one for randomness. Okay. And the authenticity check is a, a second, um, uh, a, a different, uh, slightly different topic where this is, um, again, I'll go into detail in a little bit, but this is uh, to prove the authenticity of a device, so to protect against evil made and supply chain attacks. Uh, and there's a secret on the chip um, and that's uh, set uh, at factory installation. Uh, every device has a unique secret. And the BitBox app itself will send a challenge response. Uh, and so basically prove that you have the secret by signing uh, a random data, a random message. And it comes back and um, the BitBox app can verify if this device is authentic or not. And so. There's a saying uh, we mentioned, others mentioned, always trust the screen on the hardware wallet, but this is the one case where you can trust the screen on your computer, where if it tells you that the device is not authentic, you should probably trust that and contact support. Okay, so a little bit in the life of a bit box. So it's born in a factory. A stork called UPS might deliver it to your house. Um, or if you want, there's actually bit boxes for sale uh, in the store at the back of the, the booth um, if you want to uh, buy anonymously. And it arrives at your home. And so at the factory, of course, we assemble it. Uh, we're a Swiss company. It's Swiss made, so we have a manufacturer in Switzerland. We think it's important to be able to shake hands with our supplier uh, so we can avoid some supply chain risks. Um, the bit box itself has the screen uh, inside. Um, we uh, we get some feedback that people like the, um, the discrete nature of it. Uh, so we specifically designed it not to look shiny or flashy or special. We wanted it to look like a normal USB stick. And we think this is also a, a security mechanism where if you have it in your pocket, people don't necessarily know it's, uh, you're carrying Bitcoin in it. Um, the screen inside, USB-C compatible, so it can plug directly into mobile phones and new computers. Uh, has a micro SD card backup. This is um, for automatic instantaneous backups. And so for new users especially, the setup process can be tedious, but with the BitBox it's quite fast. We'll give a little demo. And it has, uh, instead of physical buttons, it has touch buttons. Um, and the secure chip and the MCU are below. And during manufacturing, we actually fill it with epoxy. And it's a special epoxy that should be resistant to a lot of acids. Uh, and the idea here is that if someone tries to break open the device to switch chips, um, they'd actually ha the, the chips would uh, stick more to the uh, casing than the PCB board, and it should rip off. And we also have um, casing pins, and those should break also to try to give some evidence of physical, um, uh, physical damage. Um, so then, of course, we do an installation of the code. We install the bootloader. We do not install the firmware. We think it's important that once the device gets to uh, the destination that people will be running the latest uh, firmware. And so when you first get it, part of the setup process will be to load the latest firmware. It's safe again because we sign the um, firmware itself. The bootloader checks that. Provision the secure chip settings, so the last slides with the security architecture to make sure the secure chip can do all that. Um, we also pair the secure chip with the microcontroller. 
what that means is um, if the secure chip or the microcontroller was replaced uh, after factory installation, the device is just not gonna work. They, these chips are paired together with an encrypted channel that can't be changed, and um, you can't just sw simply swap out a chip. Uh, we have a memory protection unit. Um, very briefly, that is on the microcontroller, and you can specify different um, permissions for different parts of memory. So for example, don't execute this code ever. Uh, this car part can never be written, uh, and so on. Uh, and stack smashing protection is um, a technique to uh, abort on uh, buffer overflows. And so you just have a random number, small random number before and after any data you put into memory. And those random numbers are checked after every operation such that um, they didn't change. Because if they change, then you have a, a stack overflow of vulnerability. And so this will help protect against that and of course disable the debug ports. And so on the road, um, we send the device in a tamper-evident uh, vacuum bag. Um, I would say that's, uh, yeah, it adds some security, but I would say uh, in general, not so much. I think the attestation key is really what helps prevent um, uh, and detect uh, tampering and uh, replacements. Um, and no mention of Bitcoin on the labels for privacy. Uh, and so the Bitbox02 in action. Let's see if we can, let's see if our live demo works. We'll have to switch the screen, and so, yeah, I was thinking there's gonna be two screens so I could show, kind of do something up here, but here's the, here's the Bitbox app in action. And so this is a live demo, Yoko is back there at the bar, and this is the setup phase where, um, uh, later I'll go through each step in the slides to say what the security is happening. So here we have, um, uh, a pairing code, so we also have an encrypted communication channel between the app, uh, in this case on the mobile wallet, and the Bitbox itself. C confirm on both sides. Um, now we're gonna create a new wallet. This is showing the, the setup process. Um, entering a name for the device. Approving the name itself on the device. Now we're gonna set a password. And so here you can kind of see how the, the touch sensors work. Uh, those are actually alphabets at the bottom, uh, and there's a selection mechanism where you can pare down to uh, make words. We have lowercase, uppercase, and numbers uh, possible. Repeat the password. Sorry, the camera's not so well, you can't can't see it too well, but repeat the password. Uh, success, it says. And it's taking a little bit of time here to do some cryptography, which I'll explain. Unlocking, um, and here it's uh, the backup, so making the backup on the device, and these are all warnings to say, don't give this to anyone else, um, like I said before. Uh, that was a, a time, confirm the time, so the backup has a timestamp on it, so you can kind of keep track of it. And that's it, you're set up. And so I think, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we do spend a lot of time try on the easy part, trying to make things really easy. So we really want to be um, the hardware wallet that you can offer to your parents, or your friends, uh, to try to orange pill others. And we think uh, making a setup process as easy as possible uh, is in line. Uh, and so for those of you who maybe don't necessarily trust um, micro SD cards, then we also offer the option to write down, display the, the seed words and you can write them down on a piece of paper or pound them into metal. Okay, and so, let's see how I'm doing for time. Okay, good. So, um, so what's going on under the hood? So on power up, when you first plug it in, you can choose which side uh, of the screen to display um, the orientation. Um, and right now the bootloader is checking if the firmware is valid and signed. If it's not, it's just gonna go to the bootloader and ask you to load new firmware. The secure chip and microcontroller are checking each other if they're actually paired, if they haven't been replaced. Uh, and the attestation check is being done by the app itself uh, to check if the bitbox is authentic. Uh, but furthermore, um, this attestation check is going, going through the firmware. And so the firmware is also checking the bootloader if the bootloader is authentic by taking a hash of the bootloader and feeding it back to the app to make sure that the bootloader is a known bootloader. 
Um, on first use, we have this uh, encrypted communication channel. We're using uh, something called the noise protocol, which is pretty nice. Um, and then you saw this, uh, so this is a desktop screen. So create or restore, you can restore from the micro SD card, uh, enter the name, set the password. Um, and so at this point, we're now creating the wallet seed. And I mentioned before um, that the Bitbox uses different sources of entropy. We have the um, true random number generator on the secure chip. We don't want to trust that, so we combine it with a true random number generator that's on the microcontroller. We don't want to trust the, the chips on the Bitbox itself, so we actually pl provide a unique um, random number from during factory installation, and so this also gets cryptographically combined. I should mention that um, uh, with entropy, there, there is way, techniques to combine multiple sources of entropy such that your entropy is guaranteed not to be weaker than the strongest form of entropy. Um, and by combining uh, different types of entropy, um, you're, you're, gonna get the you're gonna get the best entropy uh, of uh, whatever the best source of entropy was. Uh, and so in that way, you don't have to trust uh, any of these five. You just need to trust one of those five. And we don't want you to have to trust us, so the computer uh, running the app will also give entropy from your own computer, dev random. And we don't want you to have to trust anything uh, digital, and so the password itself that you supply is also um, stretched and included in, in this um, wallet seed. Uh, and if you don't want to trust all that, we also offer an option where you can roll your own dice. <laughs> And you can create your own words, and we have instructions on our blog. You can read about how to do that. And you can enter that yourself. OK. And then backup, um, I mentioned this already. So the instant backup with the micro SD card um, optionally display the mnemonic word list. OK. And so now let's go back to the next demo of signing. This one should be quicker. And so logging into the device, um, magically there's some Bitcoin, $1.95 in Swiss francs arrived. And so uh, clicking, there's a send to receive button. Uh, right now he's uh, creating a new receive address, so we're just going to do a transaction back to ourselves to another address in the wallet. And this is one of the nice features with the sliders, or with the invisible touch buttons, is that you can do a bunch of different UX that we think um, can be fun to play with, but also improves the speed uh, of usability, makes things faster. And right now he was sliding through the uh, address and so you can touch, you can slide, you can hold. Uh, so he's copying the address. Now I'm going to, uh, oh, he's already um, sending. So clicking the, the fee rate, enter the address, sending. So it loads onto the device. And again, you can see the amount in BTC and the receive address on the bottom. And you can scroll through. Go to the next, you can see the fee. And then if you hold with two fingers, that's the confirmation. So we don't want, auto, we don't want um, um, you to make an accident when you're doing something important, so we have a hold button so like a uh, uh, touch doesn't make a, make a mistake. That's it. Yeah, and that's how you send coins with the pit box. OK, we can go back to the slides. Um, and so under the hood, again, we're logging in. Um, when you enter the password, uh, this touches into if someone steals a device, can they just guess your password? Uh, and so the first stage of security is the microcontroller itself. Uh, if you enter the password wrong 10 times, it's just going to erase itself. The second step, assuming that somehow that gets bypassed, uh, we have another um, security in depth with the secure chip. It stretches the password using this KDF function that takes time. Um, and uh, I forget exactly, about, about a second it takes per um, um, stretching. And so this little time delay with the lock moving, this is what's happening at that point. Um, and so if some, for, for example, if you have a eight character alphanumeric password, on average, it's gonna take 1,000 years for someone to brute force it. Um, there is a counter in the secure chip. This is a lifetime counter. It only goes up, it can't go down. 
And we set a 730,000 try limit on that uh, as another uh, fallback mechanism. Um, that's a very small percentage of all the possibilities of, um, yeah, of, of options. Um, but some people worry that, okay, this, there's a lifetime counter. It's going to run out before I, end, I stop using my device. But if you log into a Bitbox once a day, uh, every day, it's going to take you 2,000 years to, to use up the counter. So we think it's okay there. Uh, however, if someone is trying to log in as fast as they can, like every second, uh, this counter is going to get used up within a day or, or a couple days. Uh, so again, two, two mechanisms to prevent brute, for, brute force protection. And so, yeah, this is what's happening right now. This um, uh, stretching of the password, it takes a little bit of time. So we show a lock that's unlocking, and then now you have access to your wallet. Uh, I'd also mention the normal USB API. Uh, it's only opened after login. Um, and then, like, like I explained, you can see the coins, you can verify, hold. And uh, I think this is the last slide. Then we broadcast the transaction, then we also have a couple extra options for privacy, which is, again, connect to your own node, and we also offer Tor support for, for many years. That's it. Thank you. And so, I don't know if they want to uh, kick me out. Uh, I ended four minutes early. <laughs> if, if someone has a question, if they allow it. Yeah, there's a hand up over here. Sorry? Yes, you can buy them here. Thank you. Um, we actually, in the store at the, the place with all the booths, uh, with the vendor booths, there's a store in the very back where you can buy books and T-shirts, but you can also buy a bit box there. Yeah, you can buy it anonymously. Yeah, so that, that that's the most common request is can you connect to an iPhone? Unfortunately, no. Uh, you can connect to an Android, so it works with Android. It works with uh, desktop, of course, Linux, Mac, um, uh, Windows. Um, it's all the same. Uh, code base that we're running on both. Um, yeah, iPhone, they're, they just, uh, they're like a troll under a, to under a road, cause, making everyone pay a toll to actually connect the device. Um, and so we're, we're looking into it, but um, yeah, it's pretty invasive what, what they actually ask, but we're looking for ways around that. Not a risk for what? The, the micro SD card? What's it used for? Yeah, so that's for doing instant backups. And so instead of writing um, this word list onto a piece of paper, we save this onto the micro SD card. Uh, and so especially for new users, the concept of a mnemonic is really confusing. It's really stressful to uh, spend 20 minutes um, typing, writing down the words, and then re-entry it into the hardware wallet. And so we just make concept of a backup, which is understandable, and you can uh, instantly um, uh, create the wallet, have the backup. And then the idea is you take the SD card out, you don't need to use it anymore, and you put that in a safe or wherever you'd put your normal piece of paper with your word list. Seed phrase. Uh, at which moment can you get the seed phrase? So it's related to the last question. So the seed phrase is automatically put onto um, the SD card. But after you do the setup, there is an option in the, um, in the app itself. You just go to settings, and then you can say display mnemonic uh, word list. Yeah. Uh, kick, kick me out when, when you want. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking or answering questions. Um, maybe, uh, how does the attestation defend against sidechain attacks? Uh, I'll, try, I'll try to answer it really quickly, <laughs> but then we can talk more at, when I come down. But basically, um, we set at the factory installation, um, each bitbox has a secret 
um, created inside of the secure element itself that can't be uh, removed from the secure element. Um, we sign this key, the secret key, with another root uh, key that us as a company own, so we know that this key is authentic, that we, we did this during the factory installation. And then when the device gets to the person, um, we send uh, a random string to the secure chip. The secure chip uses the secret to sign it. We know the pub key uh, that's public. And so using the signature and the public key and um, the signature of the private key, which was from a root key, then we can guarantee that uh, it's an authentic device. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like I have to wrap up now. So I'm, I'll, I'll be around outside, so if anyone has any more questions, I'm very happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much.